As the last ice sheets retreated and the North Sea opened to swells and weather, small bands of Mesolithic hunter-gatherers followed rivers and coasts into what we now call Scotland. They left shell middens, microliths, and the faintest genetic echo, small in the modern population but still detectable. For millennia they were the first chapter. Then the story quickened. About 6,000 years ago, farmers arrived from the Near East by way of Anatolia and continental Europe. They brought wheat and cattle, polished stone axes and new ideas of land and lineage. Their descendants raised timber halls and stone circles, and the landscape began to carry names we still speak, places like Orkney and Lewis, where ritual architecture and farming life fused into something enduring. Roughly 4,500 years ago, a new wave rolled across Britain, people associated with the Beaker culture. Archaeology names them for their bell-shaped pottery. Genetics recognizes them for something far less decorative, the scale of turnover they introduced. Ancient DNA indicates that these incoming groups replaced most of the local Neolithic gene pool in many regions. With them came step-linked ancestry, different burial customs, metalworking horizons, and social packages that reshaped how communities organized labor and marked the dead. The ground beneath Scottish identity shifted again, not in a single stroke everywhere, but region by region, valley by valley. Language and identity stitched themselves onto that base during the Bronze and Iron Ages. What we call Celts were never a single nation, but a web of related speech, art, and practice radiating from Central Europe. In Scotland, those patterns were adopted unevenly. Coastal lowlands and islands changed earlier, while uplands held longer to older ways. The result was a mosaic of tongues and customs rather than a single ethnic block. In the Northeast, Roman writers later glimpsed confederations they named the Picts, painted people, but genetics suggests they were not a separate biological species of Britain, so much as another regional expression of the Iron Age world with their own icon stones, hill forts, and political networks. Rome came and looked north. It built the Antonine Wall and garrisoned the lowlands for a time, but it never absorbed the high country. The genetic footprint of the empire in Scotland appears limited. After the legions withdrew, influence from the southeast intensified. Anglo-Saxon settlers pressed into what is now England and brushed the Lothians. Language and law traveled with them, but the deep genetic remake inside Scotland was modest compared to cultural pressure along the borderlands. Then, the longships arrived. From 793 to 1066, the Norse carved their presence into coasts and islands. Nowhere was the genetic legacy stronger than in Orkney and Shetland, where modern DNA still carries a substantial Norwegian component. On those islands, the sagas feel very near. Across mainland Scotland, the Norse signal is lower but traceable, layered into communities through trade, settlement, fosterage, and intermarriage. The Viking Age braided the Hebrides and the Northern Isles into a North Atlantic world and left loanwords, place names, and family lines that persist. The Norman conquest of England did not make Scotland Norman, yet it pulled Scottish elites into continental networks. Kings, especially David I, invited Norman lords north with land grants, burg charters, and a taste for stone castles. The surnames of that migration survived, Bruce, Fraser, Stuart, and some of their lines entwined with the throne. In the 12th and 13th centuries, another strand entered as Flemish merchants and craftsmen settled under royal patronage adding skills and blood to bergs that would knit the realm together. Across the water, Ireland mattered in more than one era. In late antiquity and the early medieval period, the kingdom of Dalriata linked Argyll and Ulster, carrying Gaelic language and faith across the channel. Much later, during the Industrial Revolution, Scottish towns absorbed a new Irish diaspora, a demographic rather than a deep genetic shift but important to the social fabric. Modern genomics has begun to resolve these threads with fine focus. Studies of living people across Scotland reveal distinct regional clusters, borders, southwest, Hebrides, northeast, Orkney, Shetland. A striking divide runs roughly along the Firth of Forth, separating northeastern from southwestern signatures and echoing, perhaps not by accident, the old territories of Pict and Gael. The Hebrides look like a genetic island as well as a geographic one, relatively isolated communities that developed a distinctive profile over time. Orkney and Shetland stand apart too, their Norse inheritance written not only in names and archaeology, but in the genome. Some links surprise at first, and then make sense when set against trade winds and sea routes. 
the Isle of Man clusters with people from southwest Scotland, as if the Irish Sea were a corridor rather than a barrier, a small yet real signal of North African ancestry, markers associated with Berber or Touareg groups, appears in a sliver of the population, a thread dated to roughly five and a half thousand years ago. One plausible path runs up the Atlantic façade, into Iberia, along the Bay of Biscay, into France, and through the western seaways to Britain. There are also Siberia-related markers detected most clearly in Orkney, and to a lesser extent in parts of mainland Scotland. Those signals likely trace back to movements that also carried steppe ancestry into Europe, tied in scholarly work to the Yamnaya horizon of the Pontic Caspian region. Names remember what genomes sometimes blur. Mac and E. Ax still announce Gaelic's son of, as in MacDonald or McGregor. Sutherland means southern land from a Norse point of view, a cartography that only makes sense if you sail from Norway. Armstrong probably began as a boast or a battlefield nickname. Campbell in Gaelic evokes a crooked mouth. Forbes, Ross, and Keith carry echoes that antiquarians trace to Pictish districts and early territories. Norman introductions never quite shed their continental birthplaces. Bruce from Bricks in Normandy, Fraser possibly from a word for strawberry. Genetics occasionally lights up individual stories with theatrical clarity. A noteworthy share of people bearing the surname Stuart carry a Y chromosome pattern linked to medieval royal lines, popularly cast as a royal signature. Actor Tom Conti has been shown to share ancestry with Napoleon Bonaparte through a Saracen forebear who reached Italy around the 10th century, an unexpected tie that only appears when modern data and medieval mobility are seen together. Not every people from Scotland's chronicles has faded without trace. In the Stirling O'Shiel belt, geneticists have pointed to a marker concentrated where the Maiea Tai, an Iron Age confederation that fought Rome in the 3rd century, once ranged. That does not resurrect a tribe whole cloth, but it does suggest that political names written by outsiders sat atop communities with continuity on the ground. Pulling the lines together, the picture that emerges is neither a simple replacement nor a timeless purity. It is a palimpsest. Mesolithic foragers laid down the first strokes. Anatolian-derived farmers reoriented the canvas. Beaker Age newcomers overpainted much of what came before. Celts, as culture more than conquest, supplied designs and dyes. Picts labeled a northern variant of the same broad fabric. Romans edged the border. Anglo-Saxons touched the southeast. Vikings salted the coasts and islands. Normans and Flemings rewired towns and titles. Irish ties pulsed across centuries. Ancient DNA turns monuments and chronicles into measurable ancestry, and modern DNA shows how those ancestries still vary from island to island, firth to firth. The result is not a single origin story, but a layered one, surprising in its roots, precise in its regionality, and rich in human detail. If you know your surname, your island, or the valley your grandparents came from, you already hold a thread of it.